Hey, pre-calculus. All right, so we're going to look at another lesson here. This is lesson 4.7. Uh, this is actually one of my favorites of the year. I think it's really interesting what you can do with parabolas, even when you're not throwing things through the air, making an obvious parabolic shape. Uh, what we're going to be looking at is uh, how you can actually model situations with quadratics, and you can look at maximizing certain quantities or you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff you can do, but a lot of it's going to revolve around the idea of coming up with the biggest and best solution you can to a, to a problem. So I'm going to share the screen and we're going to get right into this. So if we go here from the beginning. So section 4.7, modeling and solving equations using quadratics. So what this whole section is about, we're just going to see in just a sec here. So first of all, I'm going to say something pretty obvious. Many relationships can be modeled with a quadratic function. What we're often going to be interested in is finding some sort of value. We're going to call it x for now. We're going to be looking at maximizing or minimizing something. Like maybe you want to maximize the area of a rectangle. Maybe you want to get the most money out of a certain business model. So you're going to be looking at profit. There's a whole bunch of things you can actually be looking at. The simplest example that I can come up with as to what we would use this for would be a situation in which I give you a very fixed perimeter and I ask you draw a rectangle and give me the rectangle with the maximum area possible. If I give you a perimeter of 20 centimeters and you have to draw a rectangle, what is the biggest area possible? So there's a whole lot of ways we can try and do this. We can sit there and we can try and draw rectangles and go, eh, maybe that's okay, eh, maybe that's okay. The sum of all the lengths here, 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 and here always has to add up to 20. So there's nothing we can do about that. So what we might have is we might have a square. We might have 5, 5, 5, and 5. Or we might have a rectangle that's, I don't know, 8 and 8. And what this big is, that'd have to be 2 and 2. And there's a whole bunch of different possibilities. Which one gives you the biggest area, though? And the answer might be obvious. You might even know it already. But what we're going to do is we're going to just take a little sec here. We're going to see how this would look if we sat down and did it with trial and error. And then we're going to spend the rest of the class looking at systematic ways of doing this and other similar problems. So if we actually tested some values of width and length, one thing we know for sure is that the width and the length, we know two widths plus two lengths would have to add up to 20. We know that for a fact because that's the perimeter. And if you don't really remember what perimeter is, remember if this is width and width and length and length or vice versa. Uh, this plus this plus this plus this. That's what the perimeter is. So two W's and two L's and it has to add up to 20. So what are the possibilities for W and L? You can think of one silly situation where you've got a rectangle of zero width and you've got uh, 10 length on either side. That'd be really weird. It'd be like zero and it'd be this long skinny thing. It actually, this wouldn't even exist. It'd basically just be a straight line. What's the area of that? Well, how do we calculate the area? The area is very simple. We would write maybe in the third column, the area is equal to length times width. So, let's just put a little division in there. So the area would be zero. And obviously that's not going to be our maximum area. If we had a width of one, then the length could be nine. What I'm doing is I'm just making sure these add up to 10. I'm actually kind of just forget about the twos and kind of cross them out and do it width plus length equals 10. Uh, one, 1 times 9 would give us an area of 9, and we could do 2 and 8, and 2 times 8 would give us 16. And we can see what happens as we make the width a little bigger, and the length gets a little smaller, and we multiply them together to get the area, we're going to get bigger numbers. And this is going to keep happening for a while, and that's 24, and we could go 5, and we could go 5, and we get 25. We could even make the width 6 and the length 4. But all of a sudden, we start to see something happen here. 4 and 6, 6 and 4, that's going to give us 24 and 7 and 3. And we can kind of see what's happening, actually. If you're paying close attention to this, you'll notice there's quite a pattern. And if you're paying really close attention, you'll notice there's actually really quite a pattern. If we look at the differences here, we're going up by 9, and we're going up by 7, and we're going up by 5, and we're going up by 3. We're going up by 1, and then we're going down by 1, and we're going down by 3, and we're going down by 5. If you remember from a couple lessons ago, this, these are the first differences, and this is what happens in a quadratic. If you even calculate second differences, you'll notice we are constantly decreasing by 2, and again, these being the same, we 
is worth quadratic. So this is definitely a quadratic function here. That's what I mean. Many relationships can be quadratic. So what is the best solution? It looks like the biggest area is right here where we have a width of 5 and a length of 5 to get 25. Now, if you had to do that for every single one of these problems, come up with a table of values and test and go through and calculate, that would be very time consuming and quite frankly not very interesting. But we're going to look at ways we can do this and other problems systematically. So on the next slide. So oh boy, okay. Well, let's pretend those came up in the right order. Um, we're going to be systematically solving for maximum points. We're going to be guided by a, a few following key points. Okay, well, here's one of them, but uh, okay, I don't know why these are coming out of order. Okay, so first of all, the first thing I want to mention, we'll just cover this up now. All quadratic functions, they have to be written in terms of one variable only. So what we're going to do is we're going to have things like area, which is a function of length times width, and we actually don't want two different variables. We're going to want to get it down to one variable because when we do things in math, in this course anyway, we're going to have like x and y. We want y to depend on x, and we don't want some other thing like you know, z going in the third dimension. We don't, we don't want that. Okay? So everything's got to get down to one variable. So that's a big key, uh, key guiding principle. Usually we're going to use the method of substitution, and I'll show you what this is all about when we get there. Uh, minimum or maximum values on a parabola are the y values of a vertex, so we're just going to remember that uh, q, when we get things in vertex form, that is the y value uh, of either the maximum or the minimum, depending on whether the parabola is opening up or down, more on that later, but just remember, when we're looking for maximum or minimum value, we are looking for that value of q. Uh, we're also going to keep in mind that the x-coordinate of the vertex is always located halfway between the roots on the axis of symmetry. That's going to be very useful for solving certain problems as well. And then finally, we're going to be using factored form a lot of the time. Not always, but most of the time because of how simple it is to, uh, to get this. This is actually going to be a very important thing. Arguably, this is going to be more important than this, but they'll both have some value. Okay, so let's actually look at just a little reminder here to uh, remind us what, what A means in terms of maximums and minimums. So quite often we're going to be maximizing or minimizing a quantity, and it would be really nice to know which one we're doing. So if the vertex is a maximum, uh, it's maximum when A is less than 0. So if we wind up writing Y equals negative 2X squared plus blah, blah, who cares? This tells me a is less than zero. This tells me my parabola is opening downward, and that tells me I'm getting a maximum. And if a is greater than zero, that's giving me a minimum. So it's opening upward. This would be like y is equal to positive three x plus blah 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 blah. Okay. So this is something we've kind of talked about before, but just a reminder because this is going to be quite important, I think, for the very next example. Okay. So here's a classic textbook question. In fact, I think this one might be straight out of your textbook. Two numbers have a sum of 20. First of all, does the sum of their squares have a maximum or minimum value? And then second, we'll determine this value and the two numbers. So this question right here, this is something that I actually know kind of confuses people because they're sitting there going, what is he even talking about? Does the sum of their squares have a maximum or minimum value? So first of all, we've actually got to figure out what the sentence means. Does the sum of their squares, so we're talking about two numbers. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to say let x equal the first number, and then I'm going to let y equal the second number. And we know these two numbers add up to 20. So I'm actually going to take this, I'm going to combine this into one mathematical statement saying x plus y equals 20. Does the sum of their squares have a maximum or minimum value? So I'm just going to write that mathematically. The sum of their squares, that would be like saying x squared plus y squared. And we want to see, does it have a maximum or minimum value? I'm actually going to assign another variable here. I'm going to use the letter s, because s is for sum. Now, this is kind of a weird question, but let's just take a second to think about it. When you're taking two numbers and you're squaring them each and adding them together, is it theoretically possible to find some maximum value, or is it theoretically possible to find some minimum value? And if you're sitting there going, well, couldn't we in theory do both? Uh, not necessarily. 
the maximum value, there might not be a maximum. The maximum could be infinity. If you think about this, let's think about two numbers that sum up to 20. You might go, okay, let's pick 0 and 20. Then we go 0 squared plus 20 squared is equal to something. I guess, what is that, 400? So that would be our sum. But then you could say, well, what about some other numbers? How about let's pick 10 and 10. Then you could go 10 squared plus 10 squared is equal to 100 plus 100 is 200. So this is a new sum. Okay, Is it possible that there's like a lower limit to what the sum could be? Or is it possible that there's an upper limit to what the sum could be? You might go, well, isn't 0 and 20 going to give us the biggest possible answer? But I, we could also argue that the sum, it doesn't have to be 0, 20, it doesn't have to be 10, 10. We could do negative 10 and we could do positive 30. Those still add up to 20. But now we've got negative 10 squared plus 30 squared equals, let's see, what's that, 100 plus 900? That's 1,000. There really is no limit to what we can do here if we let ourselves have negatives. And we can because no one said you can't. So this number here can keep getting bigger. I don't even know what this is. This can keep getting bigger and bigger. I think that's 2,000, if I'm not mistaken. Is that 400 plus probably 1,600? This number can keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. There is no maximum, but there is a minimum value. So that's what that sentence means. Now, how do we actually figure that out without sitting here going through all this logic? We've got to think about, let's see here. Do, 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 do. We've got to think about this in terms of a parabola. So when you're doing these kinds of questions, you actually always have to write two equations. And I'm going to give these a title or a label. This equation I'm going to call the constraint. And it's called the constraint because this is, uh, this is what they have to follow, like the rule. The two numbers have to have a sum of 20. They're constrained by the fact that they have to add up to 20 and not some other number. Then I've got the second equation here, which I'm going to call the maximum or the minimum equation. There's probably a better word for it, but that's the way I think about it. This is the one I want to maximize or minimize. So what we generally do, the process, is we're going to take the constraint. We're going to use that. We're going to sub it in to the maximum or the minimum equation. And that's going to reduce the variables to 1. I mean, this would be sort of a silly question if, if I said two numbers have some sum, and I never told you what it was. So this is it maximum or minimum? Then I'd be like, what? Okay. But because they have some constraining factor, that sort of limits what we can choose from, and that makes it a bit more of a, a doable question. So this is actually going to turn into the sum equals x squared plus y squared. Well, I actually want to substitute this guy in. I'm going to get rid of either x or y. I find, and just like most people, I find I like to keep x around. I like to get rid of y. So I'm going to take my constraint, which is this guy here, and instead of saying x plus y equals 20, I'm actually going to say y equals 20 minus x. And then I'm going to substitute it in. So this becomes the sum equals x squared plus, instead of y, we're going to write in 20 minus x squared. Foiling this whole thing out, 20 minus x squared is going to be this. And then I'm going to clean it all up, and I'm going to get this. OK, so what this says is the sum of the squares, which is s, and I might even write that, let s equal the sum of squares, just to make it very clear. It used to be I needed to know both numbers, but now I only need to know one number. And I actually do know what y is, because y is always 20 minus x. So this contains only one variable, but it really has information about x and y. Just It's hidden. And that's something we're going to have to use quite often. OK, so what I want to do is I now want to ask the question, is this a maximum or a minimum? So what does this guy look like? If I was to make a graph over here on the side, the sum of the squares, which depends on only knowing the first 
value x, not x and y, because we don't need to, um, is equal to this. What shape does this parabola have? Now, I have no idea what shape this has off the top of my head, but I can tell you one thing. See this guy right here? This is a is greater than 0. Therefore, it opens up. So maybe it looks something like this. And what we can see is that there is a minimum. There is a possible lowest value for what the sum of the squares can be. So therefore, I'm going to say there is a minimum. Okay, now I'd actually like to figure out what the values of x are and what the minimum itself is. But I know for sure there's a lowest value. There is no highest value. The highest value is infinity. We can keep getting bigger and bigger. So how do we do this? If I knew what the equation of this parabola was, I could easily figure out the minimum. Now, you could use factored form here, or you could use vertex form here. And they're kind of both equally decent. Uh, I'm just going to take a second. I'm going to look at this. Is this something that's factorable? Um, I want to say at first glance, maybe. But you know what? Factored form does not always, always work. So in this case, I actually will go for the vertex form. So let's put this in vertex form here. You can't factor everything, but you definitely can vertex form everything. So just a quick little vertex forming. Now some of you might be going, hey, why don't you just use the shortcut? Eh, I don't like shortcuts, and you probably know that already by now. Okay, so negative 20, uh, let's see, divide that by 2 is 10 squared, which is 100. So we'll add 100 here. I'm going to skip a couple steps. I'm going to, instead of writing negative 100 here, I'm going to multiply it by 2, so it just comes out like that. Okay, so what I have here is I actually have x minus 10 squared and then plus 200. So what does this actually tell me? This tells me that my parabola opens up and the vertex is actually located at 10 comma 200. Or I can say the axis of symmetry is aligned at x is equal to 10. So what this tells me is that if x equals 10, and I guess that also means y equals 10, because x is 20, sorry, y is 20 minus x. If x is equal to 10 and y is equal to 10, then s will be minimized. So the two numbers that add up to 20 and get squared and added up to get that sum s, that sum will be minimized when they're both 10. And that's that. Cool, okay. So that's one style of question. Let's look at another one. Rectangular fence is to be constructed out of 120 feet of material and must have a divider so that there are two areas. What dimensions maximize the total area? So a little less explaining the general concept here and a little more just doing it. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna say a rectangular fence. I'm always gonna draw a picture randomly. Okay, now technically the long side of a rectangle is supposed to be L. Um, and there must be a divider, so we have to put a divider here. There's two areas. We didn't say they have to be equal, and we technically didn't say the divider can't be on some weird angle, but let's not get stupid here. I think the divider would probably be uh, something like that. You could even put it this way, but it turns out it actually doesn't matter. I'll leave that for you to work out. So this would be W as well. So what we do is we're always looking for, first of all, the constraint and then what do we want to maximize or minimize? Well, in this case, maximize. So the maximizing equation. Okay, so what is the constraint? What are we limited by? The rectangular fence, we have 120 feet of material. So when you add up all these bits, we can say that 2Ls plus 3Ws equals 120, right? The equation we want to maximize is we want to maximize the area. So I like to just start here, and then I say, well, how do I calculate the area? Well, that's simple. It's length times width. So here's my two equations. Ultimately, where I want to end up, and you don't have to draw this every time, but I actually find them really useful, I want the area to depend on not length and width. I just want it to depend on one of the two variables. And then I want to have some sort of uh, situation where maybe our parabola looks like this, and I can find it. How do I get the maximum area? So do I want it width or length? Totally up to you. I would just think about which one makes uh, which makes simpler algebra here. So sometimes uh, isolating L or W can make more sense. I think in this case, I'm going to go uh, 2L equals 120 minus 3W, and then L equals 
is, uh, let's see, 60 minus 3 over 2 del B. Then I'm going to take that, I'm going to insert it in there. So this becomes area equals 60 minus 3 over 2 del B, and then this is times del B. Okay, so now I have this equation, and I have it in terms of W only. And I want to find the uh, value of W and L that maximize the total area. So this is a quadratic equation. This is a parabola. This is almost in factored form. I'd like to turn this into official factored form. I'm not going to bother with the vertex form, because look how close this is to being in factored form already. I'm going to turn this into official factored form by rewriting this in this way. Uh, if, if I want, I could have wrote w minus 0. That's not really important. I would encourage you not to waste your time doing that. And then I always want to factor out this guy. Okay, so this is going to become negative 3 over 2, w. Now, what does 60 turn into? Well, this always gives me a tough time. Okay, so we, we're actually going 60 divided by negative 3 over 2. So how do I actually do that? That's like 60 times negative 2 over 3. Uh, 60 times 2, that's negative 120 over 3, which is negative 40. Okay, this is this is how I do it. I'm grade 8 fraction style, but it actually works. So this will be w minus 40, and then there will be another w. So what this tells me here is on my little sketch, I could actually sketch this a little bit better. One of my intercepts is here. I'll call this w1. That's 40. And the other w2. Well, there's nothing there, so it's a 0. So here at 0 and here at 40, we're going to have a parabola. It opens down, so it's a sad parabola. And it's going to do something like this. So as the width changes from 0 all the way to 40, the area is going to start low, go all the way up. It's going to hit a maximum here. It turns out at 20, which is halfway in between. And it's going to uh, keep sinking down as the width gets down to 40. If you think about that in terms of our little tri uh, not triangle, rectangle model up here, that makes a lot of sense. If width shrunk to 0, the area of this rectangle shrank to 0. And if width went to 40, you'd have a 40, 40, 40. You'd use up all 120 feet of your fence, and you'd have nothing left for the lengths, and it would be this weird, like, <laughs> really skinny little rectangle of zero area. So I think that should make some sense what we've got uh, going on there. And I do encourage you to take a second, make sense of everything that we're doing from time to time. Okay, so what we can see here is if w equals 20, the area is maximized. It's as simple as that. So what dimensions maximize the total area? We can say that w equals 20, therefore, W equals 20 feet, and the length equals, and we just have to work that out, um, if we've got uh, 20, 20, 20 for the Ws, that's only 60 feet remaining, and we've got two lengths, so I guess that would be 60 divided by 2. And this is what maximizes the area. Now, I didn't ask you what the maximum area is, but you could work that out if you wanted to, and that wouldn't be too hard. You'd actually just take 20 for w, and you'd stick it back into your area of equation. Some questions will ask you to do that. I'm not. Okay, so the last problem here. Now, if you've been following along great, uh, you might consider taking a little breather. This is usually a question I leave for next class, but since we're on YouTube, you can pause it. And, you know, just think about what we've done so far. The reason why I usually stop here is because this is a little bit of a different style of question. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do this question here, and then we're going to think about what we're doing exactly. So normally what we do, let's read the question. Two children are selling lemonade for a buck a glass. They normally sell 130 glasses per day. They notice when they increase the price, they sell fewer glasses. What's the optimal price to maximize profit? So in this case, we're going to think about what is it that we want to maximize here, and it's pretty obvious. We want to maximize the profit. So I'm going to call it P. P equals profit. I'm going to assign some other letters here. So let's see. We want to sell lemonade for a dollar a glass. Uh, you can call that the price, but I've already used P. So I'm going to say C for cost. And then uh, they consistently sell 130 glasses per day. The number of glasses. I, how about N for the number of glasses sold? 
So what we want to do here is we want to think about maximizing the profit. And if you think about this, the profit equation becomes P equals, you, you earn money taking the number of items you sell and multiplying by the cost per item. So what we're going to do is we're going to say the cost per glass, which is what C is, I could even write cost per glass, the cost per glass, we're going to multiply that by the number of glasses sold. I know it's profit. Someone's going, well, it doesn't actually cost them money to squeeze lemons. Eh, don't worry about it. The parents are paying for that. So the cost per glass is C, and we're multiplying it by N, the number of glasses sold. So this is the equation we want to maximize. So we have a classic problem here where we've actually got two variables, and we want to get it down to one. We want to have this graph of the profit, which depends on either C or N, but not both. If you're a clever kitten, you can actually work out how the cost and the number of glasses sold are related to each other, but it actually turns out it's a little tricky and there's a much easier way of doing this. This sounds counterintuitive, but I'm going to introduce one more variable and x, I'm going to say x is the number, oops, the number of price increases. The reason why I'm doing this is because it's actually really easy for us to write cost and number in terms of the number of price increases. To see how they depend on each other, it's a little tricky. It's not impossible, but it's a little tricky. So what I can do here is I can actually write the cost in terms of the number of price increases. So normally, they cost $1, and every time I jack up the price, they're increasing by 0.25 cents. So an algebraic expression for that would be 1 plus 0.25x. So 25 cents more times x. If I increase the price two times, I'm going to increase it by 50 cents and so on. The number of glasses sold. If you've been a passive watcher here, take a second think about this. What is this going to look like? Pause the video if you need to. 130 glasses is the number you sell, but when you raise the price one time, you sell 10 fewer glasses. So we're going to actually take away 10 times the number of price increases, so minus 10x. Now we've got it all in one variable, and instead, <laughs> instead of C or N, which I realize I just spelled corn, let's get rid of that, we're gonna make it in terms of X. So we expect the profit to go up something like this. There's gonna be some maximum when, uh, when X is just the right amount, the number of price increases. Okay, so what this is gonna look like here is we've got this guy. P equals blah, 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 blah with X. So we've got it in terms of one variable, which is fantastic. What we want to do now is we want to get this in a form where I can easily graph it so I can find where the maximum value of X is. So the best way to do this is to put it into factored form because it's already factored, so we just need to get it just a little bit better. What we need to do here, and I'll switch colors, is we need to take this and we need to factor out the back guy and the back guy. You cannot have anything in front of the x's when you're doing factored form, otherwise it's going to mess up the whole, whole situation here. So uh, the profit is going to be, um, I'm going to factor out a 0.25, so that makes the first bracket, uh, I'm going to put x first, and then taking uh, 0.25 out means dividing each term by that. 1 divided by 0.25 is the same as 1 multiplied by 4. So this is actually going to be x plus 4. We're going to take a negative 10 out from the second guy here, and this will become x, and then 130 divided by negative 10 becomes negative 13. Now I want to gather those two together, so these are both going to come out front by multiplying, so this is going to become negative uh, 2.5, and then I've got x plus 4 and x minus 13. Cool, okay, so now I have all this. So what this allows me to do is this allows me to see a few things. It tells me that the parabola opens down, which is what I would expect if I'm trying to maximize a profit, and it tells me my two values of x that are going to give me zero profit. Uh, I'm going to go up here and then erase my corn, and I'm actually going to redraw this here. It turns out x can actually be negative 4 and positive 13, right? So x1 equals negative 4 
x2 equals positive 13. So this is actually going to look something like this. So before we get the answer, let's just take a sec. Does that make sense? If I have x equals negative 4, x is the number of price increases. So negative 4 is like 4 price decreases. If I decrease the price by 25 cents four times, I'm going to knock a quarter off the selling price. No, sorry, not a quarter. I'm going to knock a dollar. If I knock a dollar off the selling price and I was charging a dollar, guess how much I'm selling it for? It's going to be zero dollars. I'm going to make zero profit. Now, it turns out if I raise the price 13 times, if every time I raise the price I sell, sell 10 fewer glasses while well, doing that 13 times, I'm going to sell 130 fewer glasses. That means I'm not going to sell anything. I'm going to make no profit that way. So that makes sense, and that's very comforting when everything works out. Okay, so now I'm just going to finish this all up. What is the value that maximizes x right here? Okay, this is not one I can just look at and tell, so I'm going to remember that the axis of symmetry is always located at x1 plus x2 over 2. So this is going to be negative 4 plus 13 over 2. So that is 9 over 2, which is 4.5. So I'm going to raise the price 4.5 times. So this tells me, therefore, x maximizes p, uh, this is an awkward sentence, x maximizes p if x equals uh, 4.5, or 4.5 price raises. So you've got to remember, what are we actually trying to answer? What is the optimal price? So I'm going to therefore say the optimal price or cost per glass equals, so we calculated the cost by saying it was one dollar, we're going to add 25 cents, and we're going to do that, I guess, four and a half times. So if you did it four times, it would be two bucks. So this is going to be two dollars <throat> and uh, 2.125, I believe, or I guess two dollars and 13 cents. That would give us the best price. Okay, so now we're just going to have a small little argument here. Um, are we allowed to raise the price half an amount, half an increment? Uh, I think in your textbook you find they actually tend to not do that. I think it makes sense to do it, um, but you know what the answer in the textbook might be? You could make an argument that maybe it's $2, maybe it's $2.25. Uh, but I personally think halfway in between would make sense. Okay. So just be aware, if you're getting answers that are just slightly off, then that could be the issue. And believe it or not, companies actually do this kind of stuff all the time, figuring out the uh, maximum price. They actually model this stuff and figure out the best price. You know, the Walmarts of the world, right? They know that if they lower the prices, they'll sell more items and they'll maximize the profit. So this is a simple version of it, but it's a good one. Anyway, thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.